bridge at Salt Ash holds England to Cornwall, else England would float away to perdition. So think those whose motto is, by tree, pole and pen shall ye know Cornish men. In search of the unusual, we visit the land of piskies, pixies and things that go bump in the night and arrive at Tintatchel, 12th century post office whose roof slopes as do the tourists when the bill says, crew it, two and sixpence extra. Round here they're loyal to the crown, but don't really believe that King Arthur is dead. He means much to Cornwall, his castle still a local landmark, occupying a strongly defended position. The archway, almost gothic in shape, looks out to that sea that repelled many a would-be invader, who suffered defeat on the jagged rocks below at the hands of the gallant knights to whose courage was added the protective spells of Merlin. Whose cave this was, home of the original Gremlins. They still call King Arthur's barracks the artillery point around here and swear on St Agnes Eve they can hear strange and unearthly chanting from the ruins of the chapel where thanks were given for glorious victories over the powers of darkness. This waterfall that once fed a mill stream ran with blood. And from this window, Arthur's queen and her ladies watched their gallant warriors defeat their many foes. The girls here stay put. Every season they breed on these rocks instead of migrating to warmer climes, their descendants carrying on. Locals say they're the spirits of King Arthur's knights who became saints. Cornwall, of course, specializes in saints. There are over 600 of them in this little county. Most famous is St. Neert, called St. Neat, as is the village and the church. In this church, the windows tell the story of Neat, who, living a life of the sternest self-denial, ate only one fish each day. He fell ill and his servant, deciding that more vitamin B was wanted, caught two fish from the nearby well, fried one and boiled t'other. When he offered this feast to the saint, he was commanded to put the fried fish back. It regained life and swam away, the only tiddler in an egg and breadcrumb overcoat. On the church tower is an oak branch, a custom dating back to the time when the first Charles hid in an oak tree. The squire of that period had a birthday on Oak Apple Day, so he left a fund to provide that the day should be duly marked thus forever. A shade further on is the church of Manacken, where a fruit-bearing fig tree over 40 feet high grows from the side of the building. No roots can be seen there underground. Its origin is unaccountable, but the local belief is that it grows from the grave of an unknown warrior saint who brought back a fig to be buried with him when he returned mortally wounded from the crusade. Well, this may be legend, but the fig tree is fact, and the local kids have a lovely lump of scrumpin in the fruity season. These corny saints were tough guys, apparently, and Mr. Lucifer himself, the devil to you, only ventured to the county once. They were too formidable for him, however, and caught him napping nicely. He was duly trapped and sent to empty the only lake in Cornwall with a limpet shell, Dozemanip Pool, which is on Bodmin Moor. Bodmin Moor, bleak, lonely, the only sign of habitation, the hundred years old engine houses of the now long abandoned tin mines. To the small town of Bodmin came pack horses laden with clothing, silks and satins at bargain prices. The wives of Bodmin made the most of this opportunity. The goods sold, the merchants disappeared. And then first one and then another of the people of Bodmin were stricken with a strange sickness. The clothing had come from the plague pits of London. Bring out your dead was heard in Bodmin. Many died, their bodies buried at Crantock Headland, undisturbed to this day. Around the coves of Kynance, Atlantic rollers bounding on the gigantic rocks add the first touch of polish to Cornwall's most famous jewel, serpentine stone. In the workshops, with lathes as old as time, Workmen who can remember what Gladstone said in 1863, if he did say it, 
turn these lumps into the kind of presents from the seaside so unique they don't need labelling a present from Corn. The stone is their trademark and all the time through the shop window he can see the ocean waves doing half his work for him. He may spit but the Atlantic's doing the polishing. Legend has it that the craft goes back over a thousand years and looking at the gentleman's implements we are not going to disagree. More stonework, an aged aqueduct bridging the valley of Luxalian whose streams run with a milky whiteness. Gazing down, the aqueduct looks upon a rite that is old to them, but new to us. Let's look see. Young brides-to-be, full of hope, optimism and curiosity, come to this stream to dangle their tootsies into the liquid clay. They've been told by their grandmothers that if they do this, they'll never become crockery-breaking housewives. So they don't mind feet of clay if it will prevent butter fingers. Leaving the ladies' delicate dogs dangling, the stream runs on to the English pyramids. Slag heaps of dazzling white, making us realize we are near St. Austin. In the clay pits, water is directed onto the walls and the resulting milky liquid is damned, physically, not verbally. The residue will eventually be used to make all kinds of culinary and domestic hardware found in the kitchens and bedrooms of houses all over the country. The blocks of China clay go into the works and get the works. Molded and plonked into mould. Sometimes it's turned on a potter's wheel with mechanical help and craftsmanship is evident all the way. These folk know their jobs. Sometimes it's squirted into the mould. which, when opened, reveals the kind of teapot we used to get once upon a time. They still make ornaments, dingbats and hoodickies and decorative china, but that's only for export. China is still painted by artists used to working on this sort of material. Stencils are rubbed on. The bowl is traced, ready for colouring, done before it's glazed. Glazing is the public school of the pottery proletariat. Here polish is acquired. Glamour is garnished on, so to speak, no matter where it comes from. Kiln fires burn brightly. Stokers sweat that little more and how much it is. Crocks, which are pottery ovenware, are stacked. The china is fired. The kiln is tested and opened to yield its load of newly baked dishes. Each with its makeup burnt on it. It goes over for testing. And as far as we can see, that's done with that most famous of weapons, a blunt instrument. Sorted by girls who can only be jugglers' daughters. They know how far does it. It's that bit of string through the middle. No doubt is allowed to get away. They're not superstitious here. But Helford farmers are, for they place nine windfalls in a square in the orchard to bring good luck to the cider crop. And to keep the pixies away from the trees. 